there was something that I didn't mention before that's actually very important to understand to make sure that the definition of the index is actually a well-defined quantity. So we know that if we had a vector field of some sort and we had an isolated critical point, then we can calculate the index of that vector field at that critical point by choosing an epsilon neighborhood around that point and then using the vector field which we assume does not vanish because the critical point is isolated and this defines for us by sending at every point on this unit sphere sorry on this sphere of uh, radius epsilon and we map this vector to the unit sphere by rescaling it and that's how we define the index but it's not at all obvious that if I choose a different sphere let's say of radius delta and then construct a map from this sphere into the unit sphere those two will be different because the vector field might change slightly as I go further out again assuming that this radius is still small enough so that the vector field doesn't vanish anywhere inside that unit ball but a priori again the functions could be different so we want to make sure that the degree of those functions is actually equal and this will follow from the fact that if f is homotopic to g then the degree of f equals the degree of g so we mentioned this last time or actually uh, later on when we talk about smooth homotopies so actually you should refer to that video first before coming back here because otherwise these statements might not make sense but this is actually partly the motivation for why we actually talk about homotopies so that we can make sense of the index of a vector field at a critical point so in this scenario we have two spheres one and let's call this point C um, and in fact uh, we can write this so we have a sphere of radius um, let's say this situation is occurring in RM then this is a sphere of, radi of radius epsilon let's denote it like this and this is the boundary of the ball at the point C of radius epsilon I guess the notation before was this is boundary V epsilon at C all sorts of different kinds of notation for the same idea the sphere of radius epsilon around that um, point and we also have the sphere of um, radius delta around that point by scaling the vector at these different points along the sphere and getting a map from these spheres to um, the unit sphere we sort of have the following picture we have two functions from this sphere to the unit sphere this is the unit sphere and we want to compare um, these two different functions and so what we do is we can just translate our sphere and then we can scale it down or up depending on whether epsilon or delta is greater than or less than one and so what we can actually do is we can for any function for any point x on this unit sphere we can map it forward just by translating and essentially all you're doing is you're translating it to um, you're moving x over by c so you shift by c and then you scale it by epsilon so that it actually lands on the sphere um, of radius epsilon at the point c so you do that you can do the same thing here by translating it and then scaling it by delta and then you evaluate the vector at that point and then you scale that vector scale vector on sphere and that'll give you a point on the unit sphere again so you do the same thing here and this defines two functions from the same domain to a codomain which happens to be the same in this case because they're both unit spheres but the point of this is that now we have two different functions f and g that define the index 
or the supposed index that a priori depends on epsilon and delta, uh, and we want to show that the two are actually homotopic. So let me call the top arrow f and the bottom arrow g. So the claim is that the degree of f, or rather, yeah, the degree of f equals the degree of g. So the question that we have to answer is, if we knew f and g were smoothly homotopic, then we could use this fact above it to prove that the degrees are actually the same. And why is that true? Well, if you look at this sphere, what's happening is all we're doing is we're shifting. We have a one parameter family of functions. So let me call this homotopy h. So we actually have a one parameter family of functions whose input for every value of t, so h t, h of t, comma, a point on this sphere, we can send it to, um, so at every point, at every instant of time between epsilon and delta, I have a sphere of some radius between epsilon and delta. So all we're doing is at epsilon equals zero, we restrict here. So before I write the, maybe I will, we'll see. T equals zero at x, we're just going to get f of x. And at h of t equals one, x, we will get g of x. And so at any point in time between, We've already defined what this is, what this map is at every uh, radius, provided that it doesn't hit any other zeros, where the vector field doesn't vanish. And I think the previous notation for this was phi. And phi depends on this radius. So let me make that dependence explicit. 1 minus t epsilon plus t delta applied to x. So what this is doing is we're looking at the sphere of radius 1 minus t epsilon plus t delta, then we restrict this vector field to that sphere. That's not going to be a tangent vector field, but it's still going to be a vector field. And then we rescale those vectors at every point x, and we'll get a new vector on the unit sphere. And so we have a function of time here, where this t coordinate is getting sent here, and this is just interpolating between the two functions, f and g. And the reason that this is smooth is because the vector field v is smooth. So remember, a vector field is smooth if and only if um, it's differentiable everywhere. And because it's differentiable everywhere, when we restrict to each of these spheres, we know that it's differentiable on those spheres. Therefore, by this fact, the conclusion is reached. So this tells us that the index of v, a vector field v, at an isolated critical point, c is well defined. And even though your functions might be different, their degrees are the same.